Here I am in Dublin, talking to a pal, reminiscing about the past, pontificating about the future. He lived just across the road, 100 yards from where we are now, one Merrion Square, and many a happy hour was spent in that house. In 1882, when he was arguably at his peak, and he went to customs in New York. They said, have you anything to declare? He said, nothing except my genius. That went down well, Oscar. In 1895, he was tried and convicted of the crime of homosexuality and spent two years in Reading Jail. In 1900, in the winter, he died in Paris alone. Let me tell you what he said. Whatever I touched, I made beautiful. Now I am completely penniless and absolutely homeless, yet there are worse things in the world than that. I am quite candid when I say that rather than go out from this prison with bitterness in my heart against the world, I would gladly and readily beg my bread from door to door. If I got nothing from the house of the rich, I would get something from the house of the poor. Those who have much are often greedy. Those that have little always share. Where I walk, there are thorns. Still, we like it here. Nice and quiet. We can hear the birds and the buses. Cheer up, Oscar. There's loads of people out there that still love you. What's that you said? I can resist anything but temptation. Well, almost anything. <laughs> All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That's his. Is that clever, says Jack. It is perfectly phrased, says Algy. The importance of being earnest, of course, is both clever and perfectly phrased. I first saw it on television in the famous Anthony Asquith film version. And though at the time I didn't see what was so screamingly funny about a woman in an alarming hat taking five minutes to say handbag, and still don't, I've read the play and seen it and even acted in it, and I don't think I'll ever grow tired of it. It's so perfectly scored. Oscar Wilde's language is music. To paraphrase it is to get the tune wrong. And listening to an audience's delighted laughter at a line, well, as Lady Bracknell says, the line is immaterial, I think he's still got it. The old boy can still get it up, still adding to the gaiety of nations. Not bad going for a man who's 100 years dead. Oscar was deserted by many of his friends and acquaintances at the time of the trial. But I discovered one woman who remained a loyal and steadfast friend, and that was Ada Levison, whom he called the Sphinx. He came to stay in her house at the time of the trials, and also she and her husband went to meet him when he came out of prison. They had a great sense of fun and the ridiculous together, and they shared many letters. But she, to the very end, was a true and loyal friend and stood by Oscar. On the 18th of May, 1897, Oscar was released from Reading Prison. It was a very cold morning, and my husband Ernest and I drove from our house in Deanery Street to meet Oscar at the home of the Reverend Stuart Hedlam in Bloomsbury. We were intensely nervous and embarrassed. We had the English fear of showing our feelings, and at the same time, the human fear of not showing our feelings. He came in and at once set us at our ease. He was laughing, talking, smoking, a flower in his buttonhole, and looking markedly better, younger and slighter, than he had two years previously. His first words to me were, Sphinx. How marvellous of you to know exactly the right hat to wear at seven o'clock in the morning to meet a friend who has been away. You can't have got up. You must have sat up. My fascination with Wilde began when I read The Picture of Dorian Gray at the age of 17. And a dream came true 19 years later when I designed it for the Gate stage here in Dublin. Um, it is so much about beauty, mystery, and truth. And also his plays, they unfold with such an elegance and style, just like Brahms, never boring and always inspiring. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people still could talk like in Oscar Wilde's plays, but one can't, except you go to one of his plays and um, 
it gives you the illusion you could. Uh, definitely for me, those lines give me enough inspiration to design rooms full of beauty as I did for um, Lady Windermere's fan and an ideal husband. But who couldn't be inspired by someone who said of himself, I made art a philosophy and philosophy and art. I summed up all things in a phrase, all existence in an epigram. Whatever I touched, I made beautiful. And it's sad that he died in the Parisian hotel room, but it made him say one of my favorite quotations, which is, I hate this wallpaper. One of us has to go. My name's Danny Osborne, and I made the Oscar Wilde Memorial. We placed it here because Oscar, as a young boy, played in Merrion Square and he actually spent quite a lot of time in this very spot here, peering through the railings at the door of his home. It was his home for 20 years and the place where many of his thought processes and his character were formed. If you look at his head, you'll see one side of his face is happy and smiling and the other side is sad. I did this to emphasize the duality of his nature. He is the master of paradox. He's wearing an Egyptian scarab ring on the little finger of both hands, one for good luck and one for bad luck. And Oscar believed that you can't have good luck without some misfortune as well. Anyone who's ever read The Sphinx will know how much Oscar adored beautiful stones. So I made the sculpture out of exotic materials, which I had to travel all over the world to collect. I was particularly excited about the use of jade for his jacket. The reason I use jade is because there's a belief that it can give a person the power to live forever. That's certainly something which I think Oscar's achieved through his work and his writings. Oscar Wilde is a great many things to a great many people. To some, he's a gay martyr. To some, he's an anarchist. To some, he's a great wit. But I'm a biographer. And to me, what I read dismays me. When I read even from the early biographies, I see People such as Frank Harris saying that Oscar Wilde was a pagan born. Boris Brazel said that Oscar Wilde lived a life of complete self-gratification. Vincent O'Sullivan just said that Oscar Wilde was devoid of any inner life at all. And after he met Wilde, that great cartographer of consciousness, Henry James, talked about the great beast Oscar. And even Richard Elman, who produced the most recent biography of Wilde, talked about the attractive fiction of his Catholicism. But I believe that Oscar Wilde has a soul. Not only that he has a soul, but he's a great spokesman for the human spirit. He's a kind of intellectual guerrilla fighter who turns the weapons of the enemy against itself in paradox and wit. He's a satirized, and he is a man whose spirit is in revolt against the petrified ideologies of his time. He's one of the few first and last modernist who used the word of soul seriously, as in the title of his great essay, The Soul of Man Under Socialism. With this, he stands with Blake and after with his countrymen, Joyce and Yeats. When I think of Oscar, I think about that line in the early parts of the picture of Dorian Gray, where Lord Henry leans over uh, Dorian Gray, who's burying his face in lilacs and says, you are right to try the cure the spirit by the senses, and the senses by the spirit. It was Christmas 1972 that my life changed. I was given the collected works of Oscar Wilde and the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust by David Bowie as a gift. The next six months were spent locked in my bedroom, alone with Ziggy and Dorian. Oscar's words, his works, they had a profound effect on me as a teenager. I mean, his most famous quote was, um, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. I mean, that was it. I left the planet Dublin. I went to the moon. I hung out with the stars. I sold my soul like Dorian Gray. I became a virgin prune. Now, well, I'm 40 years of age, and Oscar is still with me. I suppose every time, every time I go on stage or about to perform in some way, I call on Dorian Gray. I put the reality in the attic in my head. I sell my soul again. I become eternally 18. Thank you, Oscar. Some kill their love when they are young. Some when they are old. Some strangle with 
these hands of lust, some the hands of gold. For each man he kills the thing he loves, but each man does not die, Mr. Wilde.